Um, here's how it's going to work. We've got six uh, short animations created by students or recent graduates uh, of various colleges and universities in the region. Um, they're all short. They're all different styles. They're all interesting. Uh, the filmmakers will introduce their films. We'll watch, and then they'll have a, a brief chat with Tim um, about their work. Then we've got time for your questions, um, a bit of time for your questions. <laughs> Tim Burton is one of the most unique, compelling artists working in film today. Seeming to spring fully formed from the asphalt plains of Burbank, California, his films showcase an original visual sensibility and a distinct sympathy for the outsider, while continuing to defy categorization. Labels do not belong on this man. Um, he's in Toronto in advance at, of the opening at Tiff Bell Lightbox of Tim Burton, the groundbreaking exhibition organized by the Museum of Modern Art, New York. And he's here today to generously share some of his time and experiences with you. Please welcome Tim Burton. So we're going to get into the films, but before we do, just one quick question. By the way, we've got a full house in Cinema 2 who are watching this on video capture. Say hi to Cinema 2, and we'll have questions from them as well. The cheap seats. Bye. <laughs> Sorry. Sorry. You snooze, you lose. <laughs> before, uh, before we start, a quick question about your time, Tim, as a student at CalArts, and what, what you learned there that served you well to this day. Uh, I got caught up in my sleep there. Uh, <laughs> um, no, actually, it was a great, it was like the second year of the Disney program at CalArts. And um, what was great about it, it was taught all by ex, like Disney, you know, animators, Ken O'Connor, like people that were all the way back going to like Snow White. And uh, so that was really great. And I always felt like the animation background was almost the, the complete filmmaking background because you had to do, you know, you had to do everything, animate, design the shots, design everything, edit, d shoot it. And so, um, you know, that was probably the best thing of all because it's almost like, it's like the complete filmmaking package mm -hmm. that d doing animation. So, you know, I'm excited to see what you guys are up to and doing and, uh, you know, it's a great time to be an animator, really. It is, it is. So, on that note, let's get, uh, get the show on the road. But not too, I, don't, I hate criticism, so, I mean, yeah. I'm looking forward to seeing them, but... I'm not going to rip anybody to shreds because it's happened so many times to me. I can't stand it. Exactly. That's what your professors okay. and teachers are for. Yeah, definitely. All right. First up, um, we've got a film called Monster in the Closet. It's directed by Sarah Rotello. Sarah created Monster in the Closet at OCAD University as part of a course entitled Film for Artists. Sarah is a graduate of Humber Institute of Technology, an advanced learnings film and television production program. And she's currently completing her BFA in the Integrated Media Program at OCAD University. Sarah, come on up and uh, introduce your film. Hello, good morning. <laughs> Hello. Nice to meet nice you. To meet Hi. you. Hi, Shane. Um, so Monster in the Closet was my first animated film. Um, I worked on it at OCAD. And I shot it on a 16 millimeter Bolex camera, which provided a unique challenge because as I was capturing frames, I didn't have the ability to play back the motion um, and watch what I was doing, like um, something you would have if you were to shoot digitally. Um, but I had a lot of support, and I had a great crew, so I hope everybody enjoys the film. Thank you. Thank you. Come on up. Yeah. Very good. Come over, come over here so Tim can see you. Yeah, that's great. Mm -hmm. My favorite form of animation, stop motion. It's funny, because it's like, every time I see it, it's just always emotional. There's something about that type of animation, that, uh, that's the kind of the first kind of animation I did as well. I love it. It's like something very emotional about it. You know, you just feel somebody's hands doing it. So congratulations. Thank you. Yeah. Um, after seeing the film for my first question, I was just curious if you see any strengths in my work or weaknesses that you could provide. The strengths are on. very simple. I mean, like I said, that's, for me personally, mm -hmm. that form of animation, I, I really do love it. I, it it's, for me, just at the heart of it, it's mm -hmm. it's there's something emotional about it. I you know I, I love seeing the fingerprint. I love seeing the hands in it. I love you know. So I mean I 
to say keep doing is that do you like that form of animation over any other uh yeah i've been doing a lot of stop motion that was the first one i did with clay um, yeah i've used other materials since but yeah but it's, it's nice it's yeah. it, it's my favorite mm -hmm. form so mm -hmm. keep going with it that's all you know I, weakness at no i mean i whatever i mean <laughs> but, you know it's, no just it's, it's <laughs> Yeah. Look at just the fact that you're an animator, that's a weakness enough. You know? I mean, you don't need any. Enough challenges. You don't need any more, you know. I mean, honestly, that's why I stopped doing animation, because I didn't have the patience for it, you know. So I, I admire anybody that can sit in the dark room and do it like, like that. So congratulations. Thank no. you. Because, you know, my advice is keep doing that form of animation, because that's, for me, personally favorite. Awesome. Thanks. Um, my second question, um, in the Tim Burton book that was published by the MoMA, there's a really cute story about a monster that's climbing the Empire State but doesn't make it all the way because of a nosebleed um, that I thought would make a nice short film. <laughs> um, so I was wondering what kind of qualities or criteria you look for in stories when you're deciding to make them into a film or not. It's just, just that whatever your personal little feeling you have. I mean, because you know how long it takes you to do something. So it's just whatever that is that, that 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 captures your spirit and captures your, your imagination that captures an idea that you want to do because that's the key it takes you so much time to do it you have to kind of be in love with your own idea in a in a sense and and just be you know passionate about it and 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 feel it strongly you know i mean you know you can see that in your thing you you can see that you felt for it and that you you, you, you know it was your thing and that's that's just that's the most meaningful thing is to just you know be in love and 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 feel really strongly about your idea. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and because you're working on things for so long, it's hard to choose what you want to work on because it's such an extended period of time. And in the development process, it's hard to know whether to focus on a specific character or a specific story. Yeah, so but it's you you know which yeah. ones are. Don't you feel? <laughs> <laughs> Come on, uh, okay. You know what those, those. Oh. <laughs> um. Yeah, I mean, that's the thing. I think yeah. you just have to gravitate to whatever one, you know, you may start out yeah. liking a character, but then get in love with another one. And yeah. I think it's, that's just the key, is whichever one you feel strongest about is what you should focus on. Mm -hmm. For sure. All right, I have to leave it there, but thank you. Thank Thanks, you. Sarah. Thanks, Sarah. Thanks, Sarah. Thank Congratulations. You. Good job. Thank you. So next up, we're going to see The Arctic Circle, um, created by Kevin Parry. Kevin uh, completed the film in his final year at Sheridan College, where he graduated with a Bachelor of Applied Arts in Animation. Kevin, come on up and uh, introduce your film. Good morning. Uh, yeah, so you're about to see my film, The Arctic Circle, stop motion short. And I finished it in April, took about a year to do. And I like to describe it as uh, an Arctic inhabitant who becomes fascinated by the sudden appearance of a mysterious box. So I hope you enjoy, and thanks. Please, uh, welcome back, Kevin. <laughs> <laughs> that was great. If I were pitching that to a studio, I'd say, it's like a cross between 2001 and uh, Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer, <laughs> <laughs> which is great. No, I love it. I love the design. Really cool. Really Excellent. good. Good job. Did yeah, you so... Do, took you, you spent a year? Yeah, a year. Wow. Yeah. It's yeah. great. No, it's really, really cool. I like the design. It's really great. Thank you. Thank you. You have some questions for Tim? Yeah, I guess uh, kind of the same thing, mm. uh, strengths, weaknesses. <laughs> <laughs> no one's going to get a weakness, I don't I think. Not, no, so I, no I don't think so. Because like I said, it, it's, it's, again, as you know, I said earlier, it's like my favorite form. Mm -hmm. And I, you know, like I said, I still try to keep a hand in it. I mean, you know, strength, you can see, you know, it's something that you care about and wanted to do and tell, a, you know, a story in, a, in an unusual way. Now, I think it's, it's, 
you know, like, um, really good. I mean, I, I don't, you, you know, there's, there are, I didn't see any weaknesses personally. There's what do you see? Quote, what really weaknesses good. do you see? Anything? Yeah. Yeah, you have trouble were, watching it? I can see all the small details that bug me, but... I, that's the, you know what? That's the great thing about that form. I mean, that's part of its beauty. You know what yeah. I mean? The, whatever weaknesses there are, are, you know, handmade. And it, so I don't see it as a weakness at all. I, like I said, I think the, those are what that form of animation has to offer. You know what I mean? So, like, it's really good. So I guess, uh, yeah, you were talking about the handcrafted quality in stop motion. So I kind of wanted to know what you thought about uh, stop motion nowadays getting uh, much more advanced in terms of rigs and slickness. And yeah, no, I know. I mean, it, that's the funny thing because it's 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 like when we did this movie Corpse Bride, people a lot of people thought it was like CG. Yeah. And mm -hmm. and I realized, yeah, well, you know, that's the mistake. You know, so I'm actually doing a film now where we're kind of going back and just trying to show a bit yeah. more of the rough edges. I mean, not rough edges, but just treat it more like what it is because you're right you can get so slick that people don't even don't even recognize the form anymore so yeah. you know that's why i like this you know you, you see things that you may think are, are are false but that's you know i think nowadays you have to be more careful that it doesn't get too slick mm -hmm. so all right yeah i was also wondering um when you're developing a project um, what makes you decide this should be done live action or this should be done in animation? Yeah, no, it's a good point. I mean, I, I do try to, it's, a, it's all personal taste, I think. I do, it, but I definitely think that way. It's kind of like, well, what should, what should this medium be? I mean, that's why for like Nightmare Before Christmas, it's like I, I kind of held out for almost 10 years because I said, well, they said, okay, we'll do it as a cell animated thing or something you know, like that. And I said, you know, this really felt like it wanted, needed to be stop motion. And so, you know, you, you stick to that, you know what I mean? It, it, it's like, they're all forms of animation are great, but it's important that the right medium and the right project, it's like casting, you know, it's like casting an act or whatever. It's really important. And I think, you know, it's, it's everybody's personal taste. I think you should just, you know, stand back and think, how do I want to see this yeah. stop motion? So do you on. think it's more of a gut thing, or Absolutely. are there certain aspects that dictate that? I think it's more of just personal instincts. I mean, that's what I go on, is like, you know, this, you know, it's like doing a stop motion version of Frank and Weenie right now, which, you know, it's been done live action, but there's something, something about the drawings that I wanted to do, go back and try to capture the spirit of the drawings, you know, so, that's made me feel like, okay, it's worth doing in this medium at this particular time. Hmm. So right. just go with your instinct. Thanks. You have to leave it there, but yeah. please, thank you, Kevin. Right. Thanks, man. Thank you. Good job, really great. Right. Yeah, good job. So uh, next up, our next animation is uh, from Adam Brown, who studied in the film program at the School of Image Arts at Ryerson University, where he made the stop motion anima animated short we're about to see, Star Searcher. So Adam, come on up and uh, introduce your film. Hey, good morning. Uh, hey, hey. Hi. Nice to meet you. Yeah, so this is a film I made uh, two years ago in my parents' basement. It's a <laughs> stop motion science fiction short about uh, the search for hope at the end of the world. So, enjoy. <laughs> hey, apologies for the technical issue. Adam, please come up and uh, tell us about your film. Congratulations, ambitious. Yeah, yeah thanks. Parents re glad to get rid of you out of the basement. <laughs> <laughs> I'm still working on another film. A lot, of, a lot of different techniques you use. What were the yeah. characters made out of? They're made out of uh, clay, uh, sculpty. Uh, really? Because yeah. they, they look not wax. Kind of, no, no. Really interesting. Hmm. Yeah, a lot of. All in camera? Did you do it all in camera techniques and stuff? Or? No, I, I had a lot of green screens. Yeah. I painted my wall green. <laughs> right. A lot of After Effects stuff. <laughs> yeah. Keeps you out of trouble, I guess. I, keeps you in the basement. <laughs> I mean, how many times have we heard that one? Yeah. 
parents' basement. <laughs> it's great. Well, you did the same thing, right? You made. Well, we didn't have a basement, but yeah. <laughs> if they did, that's where I would have been for okay. sure. Right. <laughs> uh, unfortunately, that was only half the film because there's only so much time. Yes. How, how, so. Is it how? It's a bigger project then. Yeah, it's about ten minutes long. It's all on the internet, on YouTube or Vimeo. Oh, wow. So you can all search for Star Searcher, and you'll find it. So you do it as you just go, installments as you go. No, it was a whole film. Oh, okay. Just wow. only wow. five minutes here. Yeah, very impressive. So, Use of different techniques. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I think that's one of the strengths of it, just um, all the, the invention behind it, that you have to, you know, it's a really a do-it-yourself kind of a, medium. A, so. Again, you know, like I said, you know, funny, everything that's been shown has been stop motion, which again is, is, yeah. is, is, is everybody's different, but at the same time, you still feel that great spirit of, of, of Handmade doing it, you know, and that's, yeah. you know, for me, it's great to see because, like I said earlier, it's best when you f see the roughness of it, that's part of what's so beautiful about it. So, you know, mm. I'm learning a little something today. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> okay. Um, I, I was talking to a teacher some time ago, and he said for student films, um, it's best to, you know, really try your own style rather than. Uh, do you say a, a claymation film because there's so much uh, stuff that's been done so well, right? And you don't want to compare yourself to that. Yeah. So what do you think? Do you think you should try to define your own style or? Uh, absolutely. I mean, that now is the time. I mean, I, I think it's best to not think about it. I think, you know, I was lucky when I was a student. It's, you know, I mean, we were in a program that was meant to get hired by Disney, but you know, some people had more of a Disney style. Some people didn't. And I think right now at this time, you're best off just, if you can, not think about it and just do what you want to do. And then that'll create your own style. You mm -hmm. know what I mean? It's like, because even if you're trying to do something else, you know what it's like. You're in your basement, wherever. It's going to be what you do anyway. You know what I mean? Even if you're trying to do a certain style. But mm -hmm. I think you're better off just, just like you said, go, go from your heart, go from what you love doing and do it the best you can. And that'll create your style and it's best not to think about it mm -hmm. I, I would I would suggest if you can mm -hmm. okay well thank you thank you thanks thank you, thanks. Thank you. Yeah. congratulations thanks all right, a little uh, change of pace in terms of style now, definitely. Uh, a little taste, so to speak, of one student's idea for commercial application of animated techniques. Uh, Richard Mitchell is currently enrolled in the digital animation program at Centennial College. So Richard, come up and uh, tell us what you've made. Uh, hi, good morning, everyone. Um, well, uh, I uh, created my submission as a short film, uh, a very short film, for uh, the final project of my program's first semester. Uh, the goal of the project was to create a 15-second uh, long um, station identification spot for a major network. Um, we had to create an animation that would uh, convey the identity of the network. Um, so. Uh, being a guy who always thinks with his stomach, I naturally gravitated towards the Food Network. Um, and uh, being a fan of the Spaghetti Western, once again, thinking with my stomach, um, I decided to come up with a, an interesting take on, on the idea of a food fight. So I hope you enjoy it. Complete <laughs> improvisation. We are going to take some questions from you while the booth Sorry, works man. on the tech that was issues. <laughs> yeah. Your worst night, that's your first, yeah, not being able to scream. That's <laughs> and Richard, we're going to fix it. Sorry, We're going to make it work. Uh, Jesus. Right. But in the meantime. All that work. <laughs> <laughs> horrible. Welcome to the film industry. Yeah. <laughs> All right, I saw an eager, get eager used hand to here in the front row. Can we get a microphone down here for this gentleman? <laughs> Mics, please. It's all, yeah. It's all <laughs> screwed up. It's gone to hell. Brand new building. Look at that. Uh, it's a, jeez. <laughs> look, get the work out the bugs. Yeah. Don't can just, you can talk and I can We can, can hear you. Yeah. Okay. That's fine. I can speak very loudly. Yeah. Um, I was wondering, uh, hi, I'm Ted Bender. Hi, Ted. Um, <laughs> yeah, how do you know you can trust someone enough to make them part of your creative team? 
It's a good question. How do you know you can trust someone enough to make them part of your creative team? Well, I mean, it's just, you, you never know. I mean, it, it's, it's an instinctual thing, again. I mean, for me, I've, I've been lucky because oftentimes, if, you know, because my sketches are very crude, and I find if somebody gets, sees it and goes, I get that, then th that's usually a good sign to me. It's like, because they're not necessarily taking it literal, but they're sort of feeling it and they convey that, at, that they get it. And, you know, but you, you, you never know. I mean, that, that's, but it's such a long process, as you know, that you, you kind of find out fairly quickly who you can relate to and who you don't relate to. So, you know, usually, you have the time to, to nurture that and, and to, to create those things. But it's all instinct, you know? You just gotta go with what you feel. Mm -hmm. And you tend to, to often work with, with the same actors um, in different ways. I mean, Catherine O'Hara, for example, Johnny Depp, of course, yeah. uh, Helena Bonham Carter. Yeah. I, you know, um, it's fun to work with people that you've worked with before to see them do something different. Mm -hmm. It's also fun to mix it up and work with new people. I mean, a lot of people I've worked with, you know, costume designers, designers I've worked with before. So that's fun to see what they, what they do different. Because again, it's all, that kind of collaboration is, is one of my most favorite things in making a film, is like you work with people that surprise you, that give you something back. And, and uh, whether you've worked with them before and you see them try something different or they're new, um, you know, that's the joy of, of filmmaking, is just that weird family that you have. That's true. Uh, do you have any collaborators that you met when you were in school? Do you work with anyone from the Cal Arts days? Well, it was interesting because when we were at Disney, there was a whole group of people there that, you know, I mean, Disney could have actually been making really successful movies about 10 years earlier because they had like, you know, like John Lasseter, mm -hmm. Brad Bird, John, M there was an amazing group of people that, you know, ended up doing amazing things mm -hmm. and were very eager to do, you know, things about 10 years earlier, but the, there wasn't really the, um, the structure and at Disney, there wasn't really the will to, to want to do interesting things at that point. Yeah, you kind of came in at that sort of fallow period that it was the end. Yeah, of the fox and the hound. Yeah. Everybody's favorite film. Out there. <laughs> <laughs> Cute foxes, yeah. yeah. Uh, and then, you know, they, they spent like what, five, six you know, years making that film. Mm. And you know, it's just, you know, it's like there was all these great animators and really we were all feeling like animation was dead, you know, mm -hmm. at that point. And so that's why I say it. now is such a great time because mm -hmm. every form, whether it's cell or stop motion or computer, is valid and, and flourishing. And, and it, you know, it's, it was a much different time then. Mm -hmm. uh, we, got, we solicited some questions in advance and this one's from U of T from Jackie Flowers and it sort of fits in with the theme right now. Could you ever imagine anyone other than Danny Elfman composing music for your movies? Yeah, well, I, I've had, you know, Howard Shore did Ed Wood for mm -hmm. me, which I love that score. I mean, D D no, I mean, Danny, you know, I've known him ever since I first started. We kind of started in the same time in terms of, of, of film work and, and all. So, um, no, he's always been, been a great, he's, he's like an actor, you know, it's like another mm -hmm. character in the film. So, um, you, you know, he's always been instrumental in helping kind of set the tone and, and, and be a real collaborator. So. Mm -hmm. But, you know, we have our f moments. <laughs> <laughs> Indeed. All right, uh, question. Uh, yes, up there. Yep. Mike's coming. If you could just repeat that. That's all right. That. We, okay. yeah, we're here. Yeah. Hi. Hi. Can you tell us a little bit about your creative process uh, when you're at a concept development stage, sort of in the early parts of coming up with your ideas? Yeah. Well, I mean, it's just, it's like I was saying earlier, it's just something that you love to do, you know? I mean, uh, when I look back and especially with this show and all the curators found all these rejection slips I had, you know, it's like people, you, you know, you just have to kind of fight whatever and, and kind of do what you love to do and because like you said like I say it's like it's such a long process you have to kind of really you know feel it inside of you and and not get swayed by oh well that's going to be money make money or that's going to do this or that's popular kind of thing right now whatever it's just keep it you know real for yourself and and 
that's that's the main thing, you know, because you get swayed by so many different things just to kind of keep that internal life very strong and protective and, and, and really strong within yourself. Mm. I mean, you had a three-year break between Pee Wee's Big Adventure and Beetlejuice. So was it a challenge for you to, to maintain that, to not, you know, go for a project? No, well, it? yeah, I mean, but, I mean, it was so strange because I held out for so long that movies kind of, you know, it's like I you know, read the Talking Horse movie. No. <laughs> then they made it. Well, before, you know, they, they, they did all these movies that I thankfully turned down. Um, <laughs> um, but, you know, then Beetlejuice was a strange one because it's like, when I read that, I thought, like, I, I couldn't believe anybody would want to make that movie. So that's what intrigued me about it. Yeah. And, uh, well, <laughs> <laughs> looks like it's Time's working up everything. in the projection booth. Yeah. Are they ready yeah. for us yet? Not yet? Not yet? All right. Just we'll keep ta talking. talk amongst yourself. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, so, yeah. Th that movie was... But you know, you have like I like I had an idea. Like I wanted. Oh, I thought you know I really want Sammy Davis Jr. to play Beetlejuice. And it's just like, <laughs> wow! I almost got kicked off the project right then. <laughs> and uh, so you know, I mean, sometimes you have ideas and just, uh, they work out, and sometimes they don't. Uh, you know, th that's the beauty of movies. It's like you can't predict it. You know, you you just kind of kind of feel your way through them and. Uh, you know, just again respond to the material. Questions? Right here. Yeah. Let's go the mic. Thank you. Hi, um, my name's Emma. I'm interested in asking you um, what your feelings were about game form. I mean, obviously, in you, your most recent release, you um, there were a number of different um, games that came out to accompany the movie. And as an expressive form, I wondered how curious you were about using interactivity and gameplay to drive um, storytelling and experience. Yeah. Well, I'm, I'm not a big gamer myself, personally. So I don't... I... I uh, like I played, I had a, a nephew that we played like Vice City for three hours and I thought I was going to kill somebody, <laughs> you know, I mean, I, I found it very disturbing, you know, and I thought I can't, you know, I'll, it's like a, you know, crack or something, it's like bad news. So I, I'm not a real, although I, I appreciate it, you know, and I, I um, but I, I'm, as me as a person, I, I, I resist, even though you, I deal with technology, I resist a lot because I, I find like, I like, my favorite time is when you can't be reached by a phone, you can't be looking at something, you can't, you know, just be that interiorized way, which you actually have to be as an animator. But I found that for me, it's, it's, it's a quite negative thing. Um, but I appreciate it, and I appreciate the artistry. I know a lot of great sort of gamer artists that are really cool and think that way. So I think it's a really valid thing, but you know, I, I can't really go there. Yeah. Uh, they're ready violent. for us. They're ready for us. Okay. We're gonna we're gonna give it another try. Right. So let's uh, let's Good see luck. Richard's film. All right. Well, that was worth the wait. That was 15 <laughs> seconds well spent. Come on up, Richard. <laughs> Congratulations. Thank you. Finally. <laughs> Didn't have um, that trouble at the Food Network, did you? No, no not at all. They just don't answer my calls. <laughs> Um, so uh, I was going to ask you uh, what you thought were the su successful aspects of the film and what could be improved, well, but uh, <laughs> don't add, don't ask. I, I think no, I'm but you got no, but you, you had a you had an interesting challenge and you did it. You know they must have been happy with that, right? I mean it's like you, you know, you were clever with it. It says what it says. You know it's great. No, I mean. Appetizing, I don't know. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you created characters, you told a story. All yeah, no, in 15, it's not easy to do, actually. Uh, yeah, it was quick. 15 seconds in eight weeks. Um, we had to take the, the concept from, you know, uh, we'll take the, the uh, project from concept straight through to execution. Yeah. So. Are they having you do more, like do different variations on it? Uh, no, but I mean, I'm going to go back to it at some point, I think. Yeah, so. no, it's, it's, a great, it's a great thing. Hey, look at it. Having, you know, especially as you know, as an animator, if you have a specific thing, you know, challenge to do, it does help because obviously, you know, you're in a dark room kind of 
spacing out, having a, a, a directive like that is great, you know, mm -hmm. and you, you did it, so. So yeah, what do you think of boundaries, parameters to work with it? Well, I think it's great, they're there, so. Yeah. You know, people always say, oh, if you had more money. The thing is, even if you have a lot of money, you still hit a wall, you know, mm. th th there's never enough money. But it's good to not have that, you know. It's, uh, sometimes it, it makes you become more inventive, more creative, deal with things in a way that you wouldn't ordinarily. And, you know, I appreciate that when I see that. You know, you yeah. see somebody, you're, you know, you're forced to be creative, you know, and you're not just throwing money at it and mm. stuff, so, you know. Well done. Um, well, one question that I, I wanted to ask is I know you're a, a propagator of uh, stop motion, uh, as we've heard today. Um, I was wondering what you think of, uh, what you think are the benefits of uh, CG or digital animation as a storytelling medium? I think it's all great. I mean, I, I've done a lot of that as well, you know. And I, the thing is, people always like, oh, well, this technique versus that. And at the end of the day, you still have to do the same creative process to get there, you know? I mean, mm -hmm. you still illustrate, you still draw, you still, so I mean, you know, I've worked with many great, you know, animators that do computer, you know, and it's, it's, it's the same thing, you know? You're still asking for acting, you're still asking for, you know, soul and whatever in it, so, you know, I, I think it's, it's great. And again, you kind of pick the project for the medium, you know, and I've done several things where, you know, I've done CG stuff and, you know, like I said, I've worked with great animators in that form, just like you'd work in cell animation or stop motion. So, they're good, you know. Um, and lastly, and this, this might be a bit of a loaded question, but I was, I was wondering what you feel uh, it means to be an animator. Um, well, it's lonely, as you know. It's, you know, you're a different type of person, you know? I mean, I, I, I remember going to CalArts, I thought, wow, I didn't realize there were other people out there, like, you know, strange like me, you know? Like, you just kind of, it's a, it's, a, it's a weird kind of group of, of people, because uh, it requires very, as you well all know, real specific, you know, patience, artistry, uh, you know, you really need a certain strength to be an animator. Uh, and like I said, not many people understand that unless you are an animator, you know? That's why it's kind of a special group of people. And, uh, you know, and you have to be kind of, unfortunately, not fit into society very well, you know? It's got <laughs> some problems in other areas. <laughs> <Yeah. Great. laughs> All right, Richard, your 15 seconds are up. All right, thank you very much. Thank you. All right, man. Good, 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 good luck, man. Good. All right. Well, Tim, you've, done, you've worked in digital. You've also done some TV commercials back in the day. What sort of attracted you to, to working in TV commercials? Was it something you just wanted to give a try to? Or? Yeah, people said, oh, it's great because it's like it's quick and it's... Uh, but I, I, to be honest, I, don't, I didn't really like doing it because... Yeah. Um, you know, the, the client, you know, there's like, you know, you see a monitor and then there's like bleachers set up for the, the, <laughs> the clients and whatever. And it's just like, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it was fun, you know, fun, you know, kind of quick, but I, I, it's not something I go out of my way to, to do. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Um, uh, second last animated short. It's um, uh, from Theo Wolf and Alexander Bosch, both of whom are studying animation at Loyalist College. Thanks for coming down, Loyalist. It was a bit of a hike for you guys. Uh, the film is called Opening Day, and uh, Theo and Alex uh, will come up and uh, introduce it, along with our translator. Nice to meet you. This is called Opening Day. It, uh, Took us about eight months to make from concept to final execution. We had four animators working on it, all students. And it's the story of if your job and you ha was there and you had the opportunity to play with anything you wanted and be a kid again, well, what would happen? So enjoy. <laughs> Love a good chain reaction. Please, gentlemen. Great guys. Back. Yeah, really good. I like the humor very much. Very funny, guys. Good, good job. Really good. Yeah. Well done. <laughs> Got some questions for Tim. Uh, yeah. 
So I'm just wondering about um, when you have the other artists that are involved, um, the independent artists that are involved in the creative process. I'm wondering how how do you know um, that they're growing through their independent process and how are you able to use their influence to apply to the projects? Well, I mean, you see it in your thing. I mean, it all looks very cohesive. So obviously you had a fair amount of people working on it. And, you know, it all seems like it's the same thing, you know? I mean, so that's the proof of, of I think, what you're asking, is that it all, you know, you don't see a bunch of different styles going on. You see what you guys wanted to achieve. Everybody got into it. And, you know, the, that, again, it's, it takes so long, as you know, you find out pretty quickly. I mean, I've worked with people that did, did, didn't even start out as animators and, like, on Corpse Bride or, or Nightmare, all of a sudden became great animators. You know, it just takes a little time, but you know, a lot of people can pick it up. Even not have ever done it before. So, but you know, in your work, it's all it's all there. You know, it's just, it's it's a cohesive project. Uh, I'd like to know uh, if you want to become, get a director role someday, or even a role where you're contributing greatly to the creative process and the idea of the production. What steps should you take as a younger animator to get there? Well, like I said, it's a good time right now because there are so many things going on. I mean, I, I, you know, like I said earlier, back in the days when I was doing it, it's like it was dead. So I, I think the key thing is, is just do what you're doing. I mean, because there are so many things, people will gravitate towards, I mean, first of all, Having done anything is a big deal. You know, you know that. that. That's the first foot in the door is showing people what you've done. And then, you know, it's best to not think too much about it. Just keep your passion, keep doing what you're doing. And then I think people, you know, will recognize, you know, especially doing something. That's key. That's the key thing. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Great job. Really cool. Good job, man. Yeah. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, friends. Thanks. All right, so our last uh, short of the morning, and before we open it up uh, again to you guys, uh, it's Yellow Wallpaper, created by Anne Koizumi, who's currently pursuing her MFA in film production at York University. Anne, come up and introduce your film. So The Yellow Wallpaper is a short story written by Charlotte Perkins Gilman in 1986. Um, and it's a story that I fell in love with when I was a teenager and I was reading it for a high school English class. Um, I've been working on the adaptation for the last two years, so what you're going to see today is a work in progress. I've inserted storyboard panels where the animation is incomplete, the music is a temp track, and um, and there's no voiceover, although I do intend for there to be voiceover in the final film. Um, I am going to read you a quick synopsis of the film, just in case anyone's not familiar with the yellow wallpaper, and then that'll give you a better understanding of the story. Okay. The story is about a woman who descends into a nervous depression when she's forced into isolation after giving birth to her first child. Alone in a room, surrounded by an unsightly yellow wallpaper, the woman begins to identify with a figure trapped behind the surface of the wall. As her anxiety and paranoia intensify, she is driven to free the figure by tearing the paper from the walls. Enjoy. And congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. That's it. Very powerful. It's interesting because it, it was, it was watching it thinking, you know, it's a very interesting interpretation of depression, which if you saw it in any other form, wouldn't be as powerful as that. So mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's a good mixture of the medium and the material. That's me. Very Thank good. Thank you so much. Um, I have some questions, and I wrote them down because I tend to um, forget things when I'm nervous. But uh, my first question is, because it's a work in progress, and I feel like this is a good opportunity to get some feedback, um, how effective were the visuals in telling the story without any dialogue? That's what I'm saying. Very good. I, like mm -hmm. I said, I, just the way that it looks and the puppets and the characters and the setting that you have, 
it, it's like I think it's the best way to do it. I mean, if you saw that in live action or another type of animation, to me it wouldn't quite be as powerful as it is. So I think you, you pick the right story for in the right way to tell it. Okay, thank you. Definitely. Um, I have a question Definitely on... Definitely without dialogue, yes. Oh, thank you. I have a question on adaptation. Um, the Yellow Wallpaper is an adaptation of Charlotte Perkins Gilman short story of the same title. Um, I was nervous to adapt the text because it carries so much weight and it is a very important feminist text from the 19th century. How do you approach the adaptation of, story, uh, of a story that holds so much significance for people and how do you maintain the integrity of the story yet make it rel relevant to a con for a contemporary well, yeah, society? I mean, you just said it. I mean, you you passionate about it, you feel really strongly about it and that's the best thing you know, that you or the anybody could hope for, you know what I mean? The thing is about adaptations is, you know, you read something and then you do a film, it's a different thing, it's a different medium. So I think as long as you feel the way you do about it, that's the best thing you could ever hope for, and, you know? And I wouldn't worry about it because it's like, you know, it's, it's different than reading something, you know? You're creating something that's giving you that feeling when you watch it. So, you know, I, I've never read this story, but I can see that you're passionate about it and that you feel feel it. So that's all, that's it. And I just have one qu question about your transition from animation to live action. I'm currently doing my MFA at York University and my thesis project is a live action, my first live action yeah. project. What are some of your experiences in regards to moving from animation filming filmmaking to live action? For instance, yeah. when you're animating, you're manipulating the characters, or in live action, you're working with actors. How do you transition from the paper or the puppet yeah. to the actor? Well, a lot of it is communication, and I had real trouble when I started because I didn't speak, and so people didn't know what I, you know, I mean, you know, you're right, it's a different thing. I think commun learning to speak and to communicate is a big deal. I mean, I'm still trying. It's it's hard, and uh, you know, because actors don't like it when you turn their heads and you, <laughs> <laughs> they don't, you know, you got to be careful. You know, <laughs> they don't like that sort of thing. Um, so it's it's just learning that. It's learning how do you get what you want. How do you move them without actually physically doing it? You know, <laughs> it's it's a challenge, but uh, it's it's learning to talk, and you know, you maybe you're fine with that. I had real trouble, so that to me is the is the key issue. Learn to, to communicate and get what you want. You have to be a bit more indirect. You know, it, it, a lot the, most actors they don't like to be. Some like to be told exactly what to do. Most I find don't. You know, so it's kind of a way of you know kind of bullshitting people. Really. It's <laughs> kind of like you know you gotta find your way to, to get what you want and but it's an enjoyable process you know it's, like I said it's fun to work with people and 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 have them surprise you and and and, and get into the material so you know uh, it's just communication great thank you thank so you. much thank you, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. okay it's uh, question time I know uh, Jim is Jim from Seneca here but uh, Seneca <laughs> in the house. Can we get a mic up to uh, Jim? So uh, I'm the coordinator of Seneca's animation program, and uh, I want to introduce one of our first year students, and she's got a question for you. And uh, afterwards, we've got one of our student art showcase books for you as well. Oh, great, thank you. Hi there. Um, I was wondering if there was something you wish you knew about film, like filmmaking when you were our age that you had to discover along the way, and you could maybe give us hints now. <laughs> <laughs> no, it, you know what? It's great not to know things. You know, that's part of. I, you know, I think that's part of the joy of it. Is is because it's such an unruly beast making a film, whether it's live action or animation. Yeah, you know, that's why I, I enjoy seeing things like what I'm seeing today and what I've seen in the last couple of days. You, you miss that. After you, you know, as you move along, you'll kind of long for the days when you didn't know things, you know what I mean? It, it, it's something that's just more pure about it, and, you know, sometimes you get in your intellectual mind, you can confuse issues. When you're just passionately doing something and you don't know what you're doing, those are the good old days. So I just, just cherish... The fact, you know, that you're passionate about something and you, you don't know what the hell you're doing. It's great. <laughs> <laughs> Enjoy. Embrace what you don't know. 
Um, we have a, a question uh, submitted earlier by Greg from the School of Design at George Brown College. I don't know if Greg's here. Um, the question is, you've made a successful career out of realizing your own quirky, unique visions in an industry that doesn't always reward uniqueness or quirkiness. What anecdotes or advice would you have for young, struggling artists who want to push the envelope, particularly when dealing with any gatekeepers of industry who perhaps aren't quite so open to yeah. originality? Well, I mean, some things, you know, we're in an age now where, you know, you, you can make a film, whatever, Blair Witch, Paranormal, these movies that don't, you know, you can do something that bypasses that whole thing if you're lucky. You know, it's all a bit of luck, you know, you never really, you can't predict it. It's like people say, like, well, how did you get into it? And I, th I think about it, and I, I don't really know, you know, you just kind of, it just sort of happens. And, but, you know, you're in, we're in a d day and age where, you can really bypass that if you're, you know, if you do something that connects with somebody, you know. So those those kind of movies, you know, unexpected things, not made for much money, surprise people, and you know, there's there's more of an opportunity now than ever before for that. Mm -hmm. It's true. It's true. Uh, balcony. We've got a microphone up there. I don't want to diss the balcony, so we'll take a couple of questions from from up top. Anyone? Hand over the mic. I can't see you, so. <laughs> Grab the mic and scream it out. Running. It's running, I see. <laughs> Shadowy animated the figure exit. up there. Yeah. Nice. Hello. Nice. Oh, that's loud. Ooh, Sorry. Um, <laughs> my name is Nathan. Nice to meet hey, you. Nathan, um, okay. I'm just wondering, uh, you're talking a lot about how now is a great opportunity for filmmakers, and we see that in a lot of the kind of creative screen-based media. Um, I'm wondering if you have a kind of a piece of advice for people trying to hit the kind of YouTube or, or Vimeo or, or, you know, viral crowd. Is it more, um, it, is that kind of your um, best path into it or is well, there a kind I, of... I mean, I think, so. I mean, you, you know, most people, I mean, look at YouTube more than anything right now, you know. Mm -hmm. I mean, and I've seen some great stuff, you know. <laughs> There's some really clever, funny things in there that are better, you know, that are better than most things you see at studios sometimes. So, I, I, you know, it's, a, it's, it's strange because it's, it's new, but I mean, YouTube is probably the most entertaining thing if you look up stuff, you know, that's out there. So I think that will have an effect on things. How you translate that into whatever career or whatever, I, I don't know, but I mean, you know, there's certainly some great stuff that reaches more people than any movie, TV show, anything. So, uh, you know, but I, how that translates, I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I mean, it seems like an interesting way to try and build an audience. But you're right. Where, where does it go from there? What's the next step? Yeah. I mean, if I were a studio, I'd look at some of those people and go, "Well, that person's good." You know. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I don't know if that's happening. They're, they're always a bit behind the curves, studios, but. <laughs> They, you know, they might catch up at some point. <laughs> <laughs> one day. Another question up in the balcony. We've got one more up there. Yep. Yes, you sounded a little wistful when you were talking about your, your student days and there was an element of purity there. And I'm wondering, do you ever wish that you weren't as successful as you are? <laughs> I have my moments, don't worry about that. You know, it all evens out, you know. You have your ups and your downs, you know, kind of manic depression sets in quite soon. Um, yeah, I guess yeah. that ties into being fresh too, to keeping yeah. fresh and going back to that purity. Yeah, I mean, that's, what, that's, what, that's why I'm excited to be here. It's like you see things and it, there is something really, really nice about it. And I mean, you, when you're in it, doing it, you always want the end result, you know, you want to get to where you think you want to go, but it, it is a time when you never get back in that sort of way again, which, you know, it's interesting, because I remember seeing a Matisse, the, his retrospect, and, and, you know, you kind of walk through his life, and you see, you know, somebody come full circle, and they kind of end up, you know, at the end of their life, kind of trying to find that simplicity that they had at the beginning, you know, there's something that's very powerful about that, and and you know, I think most artists are always, you know, maybe you achieve something, and you're always trying to find that simple kind of discovery again that you you know have early on, usually. Talking Citizen Kane, Rosebud. 
<laughs> nah. <laughs> let's, uh, let's take a question yeah, from... No uh, danger of that. <laughs> no problem. I uh, want to tribute to Cinema 2. This is a question from Next Door. Um, when creating Sleepy Hollow, how did you consider your relationship to the author, Washington Irving? Was this his story, or did you feel it turned into your story? And what drew you to the story in the first place? Well, I remember the Disney cartoon. That's what, uh, you know, that's yeah. what I first saw, which I loved. You know? And... Um, it's just one of those stories that it, it, it's like everybody knows it, you know, you, in school, but you never really read it. So it's mm -hmm. not something that, uh, you know, and I remember seeing, like, illustrations, like Arthur Rackham illustrations and people illustrating, and great illustrators, and, and I think that's the thing. And it's just such an iconic, you know, there aren't many American sort of fairy tales, you know, mm -hmm. and so that's kind of one, and I think that, that, that I gravitated towards that because... You know, every, every other country has so many, is so rich in those kinds of stories, and America relatively new to that sort of genre. Mm. That's true, that's true. Uh, another question from next door about your thoughts and, and how much you liked using 3D technology. Allison, I, no, I loved it. I, you know, uh, people talk about, oh, well, it's, you know, the, it, 3D is the way of the future and you know I just treat it as like a tool it's like mm. color or sound whatever uh, some things are good some things maybe doesn't matter yeah. um, but it's not I, I never treated it like it's the savior of mankind and whatever <laughs> uh, it's just you know it's it's it was a fun tool to, to work with yeah so, yeah definitely yeah and you plan to use it again yeah I mean for the right projects and yeah. stuff yeah no I mean I I, I, I would love you know, we did, we, when we converted Nightmare Before Christmas, I thought, I loved it because I thought, well, this is the way you see it. This yeah. is the way, when you're on the set, this is, and, and you know, seeing the artist's work and the detail and the puppets, you feel them more. You know, that to me was like, well, that's a good use of it. You know, so sometimes it's a good use and sometimes it's, just, it's like any tool, like wh why you want to do it, why mm. are you using it. Okay, some questions down here. Over in the corner there, we got a mic. No. Yep, sure. Yeah, sure, no problem. Yeah. Um, hi, my name is Jen. Um, I was just wondering, as you're working on projects, how you keep um, a constant passion and vision? Because I'm sure most people who have worked on any kind of project know that at some point you might feel a little stale that, or that you've gone off the course. And I was just wondering how you get back on track. Well, I don't know if you do. I mean, one of my favorite films that I did was Ed Wood because it, for me, it, that was the filmmaking process. It's like you're completely delusional, you know? It's like you, <laughs> you, you know, like while he was making Plan 9, he thought he was making Star Wars, you know? And so it, you get that feeling, you know? You get caught up, and it's, it's kind of a misguided passion, but it's, but it's great, and you have to have it. I mean, you have to be a bit crazy, and you have to be kind of obsessive. And you have to be, you know, you could be completely wrong, but if you just got to have that passion. And, and, you know, like you said, you have to, it has to be an idea that you like because you're gonna in it for the long haul. So it's something that you have to be kind of obsessed about. And whether you're right or wrong, just be, go for it, you know, drive everybody crazy. Do you find that sometimes the projects can take on a life of their own, something you didn't expect? Absolutely. I mean, that's, and I think you have to embrace that. I mean, Animation's different, I mean, because that you can control, you know, you can get kind of what you want. Uh, other films, it's, it's, you know, you can't control the weather, you can't control people's moods, you can't, there's a lot you can't control. But that's, I, I've learned to love that and embrace that. I mean, that's, that, that's why I love Fellini movies. You watch a Fellini movie, you see the process of how things just go one way or the other. And, you know, he, he sort of, to me, captures the spirit of filmmaking, and, and uh, I think you just have to embrace it. Mm. Yes, someone's got the mic here, yeah. Hi, Tim, it's, uh, my name's Joseph, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, you've worked on a number of projects throughout your career, and you've obviously been very passionate about them. Is there any particular project that you still feel really passionate about, or something that sticks out in your career that you really feel attached to? Well, you feel attached to everything, you know, for ba bad, good or bad, you know. I, th I think, um, I mean, there are probably projects that I feel closer to, you know, things like Scissorhands or Ed Wood or Nightmare or 
I don't know, but every movie you feel strongly about because you have to, you have to do it, you know. So, um, and like I said, since I'm not a great communicator, I always felt like I had to feel what feel the characters, and just so that I could understand it or impart that to it, an actor, or whatever. Um, but you feel close to everything because you spend so much time into it, and that's why I can't really watch the films very much because I get hit by a wave of emotion of like being on the set, you know, and so I, it's hard for me to look at things, you, you know, with any clarity because it's, you get so wrapped up into it. Mm. Is there anything you would revisit? No, I mean, I, you know, I think you do in your mind, you do things, whether you like it or not, there are things and themes that come back just because they're part of your DNA, you know, they're part of what, who you are. So, um, but not consciously. I, you know, I, you, I, I don't do it more of a subconscious issue. And how about the, the films that got away? I mean, Superman is kind of a famous example of a film you spent quite a bit of time on. Yeah, I've, I had a couple projects. That's the thing, you know, everybody thinks, well, you know, it's easy to get a, you know, you have a certain amount of success, it's easy to get a project done. Every single project that I've done has been difficult to mm -hmm. get done to this day. I mean, you know, it's, a, it's always a struggle. It's always a fight. It's mm -hmm. always, uh, you know, I guess that's just part of the nature of it. You know, it's not, each project has been difficult to mount. Right. right. Yes, uh, got one in the front row here. Hi. Um, I just wanted to ask, it's a follow-up about um, the YouTube um, yeah. uh, phenomenon. Yeah. You did a series specifically for the web, yeah. and so I wanted to know what made you decide to do something that would go out to people that way. And it's, it's just a different medium, you know. I think that it was relatively new at the time, so it was just a, an experiment to just try something uh, for the for that medium, I, I, I mean, now there's so many different forms of media. It's hard to keep up with with that. But um, like I said, for me right now, YouTube's probably the most entertaining thing around. You know, whatever you scarily, whatever you want to look up, you can find. You know, it's, it's a bit spooky, really. <laughs> you know, but entertaining. Yeah, ghosts from the past discovered yeah. there. Okay, uh, let's go over this side. Uh, up, uh, up. Six rows up. There are a couple of folks with their hands up. Keep the mic up there. Keep your hands up. Right. That's very exciting. Um, this is kind of a general question, I think. Uh, I'm actually a student in the illustration program at Seneca. Um, this is a question of, have you ever gone to a studio with this idea that you're like, OK, this is the best idea I've ever had. I'm in love with this idea. And they're like, Listen, Mr. Burton, this, this idea is just like too crazy. We can't do this. And you're all, all the time. I mean, <laughs> well, I'll never I just mean. Forget. I went, I pitched to the studio a long time ago. I said, I want to do a musical version of House of Wax with Michael Jackson. And that really <laughs> hit a stone wall. That actually sounds really awesome. Yeah. Uh, no, I know. I was excited about it. I was well, really passionate about it. <laughs> And I'll never forget the look on their face, you know? I is it a case, so, it this day. Uh, if you have a project like that and you get totally rejected for it, do you just be like, okay, I need to tone it down? Or are you like, I'm going to put this back and I'll bring it back no, I, later? I, I, I usually think of that as a good sign. I mean, I, and actually, I have a perverse, you know, like I remember going in to pitch Sweeney Todd. I said, you do a musical where it's 95% singing, with nobody who's ever sang before, with lots of blood. How does that sound? <laughs> yeah. I mean, it got made, but I mean, they yeah. weren't, it wasn't the most enthusiastic response I've ever <laughs> got from somebody. But there's something fun about it, you know? It, I love watching them squirm. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and why, why did you want to make Sweeney? I mean, you've said you're not a big fan of musicals. What was it that attracted you? I, I remember seeing it, I just liked it. I liked the juxtaposition of, um, the sort of beauty of the music with the harshness of the imagery and that kind of grand guignol kind of feel to things. And, you know, I, I liked his I liked, I could relate to his character because he didn't speak and he was moody and depressed. And so I thought, yeah, I can relate to that. You can make this happen. You can do that. A yeah. uh, question from next door. Have you ever seen the short film Tim about a boy who wants to be like Tim Burton when he grows up? No. I didn't know. I, yeah. I don't know. <laughs> You're already living the life of Tim Burton. Yeah, you don't need to see it. Yeah. All that's cracked up to be. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
questions. Yes, up on the, the side there. I'm going to mic up to you. Hi, my name's Kate. Oh, well, it's loud. Um, <laughs> I'm Caitlin, and my question was, do you find it difficult in transitioning your idea down to script format? Like um, when you're working with writers and you're trying just to... Yeah, I mean... Yeah, sometimes. I mean, it's just a again. It's we were talking earlier. It's like ca it's like casting an actor. It's like if you find the right person, you know. It's like it, 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 it's it's great. You know. I mean, like when I uh, Caroline Thompson who wrote Edward Scissorhands. It's like it was so such my story, but at the same time, she brought something to it. She related to it, and you know, it's just finding that right connection with somebody. You know. Uh, uh, then it's not so difficult, you know, but that's the key is just those connective relationships. Do you find that the writers might sometimes have a little bit input in how the story turns out or any like small, like minor ideas or? Well, yeah, I mean, you, 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 if you're working with somebody, you, you kind of have to like them because otherwise, why, you know, why, why is everybody there? So um, I do feel like they, Obviously, they bring something to it, but it's not like something that I prefer. Like, like for me personally, I don't like the writer on the set. I don't like somebody. I don't like anybody on the set, to be honest. <laughs> Probably <laughs> just people are have to make the movie, but uh, you know, I like to d deal with the writer and then kind of get on the set and then deal with it myself and with the actors, mm. basically. Question here in the back row, the front section. Uh, I wanted to know if um, you ever, if you harvest any ideas from the world around you, and if so, if you could tell us sort of about um, some of the, the people in your life, or the, like the characters or the events in your life that have inspired some of those stories. Well, I mean, it's, I think it's important to find inspiration anywhere, you know? I mean, I was lucky to, you know, once I had, you know, a couple of kids, that, that's an interesting form of seeing things in a new way, you know? I mean, there's something about, again, you go back, when you're new to life, you know, and you're just seeing things fresh for the first time, is it's important to kind of maintain throughout your life. That's why, you know, I spend try to spend some parts of the day just staring out a window, or whatever, because, you know, I think you get more of your feelings and thoughts when you're really not doing anything, you know, when you're not, having to engage in the things that everybody has to do every day, when you can just space out, think about something, see somebody, observe something. You know, and again, it gets harder with all the technology because everybody gets you know, into it, but sometimes just standing back and watching people and observing things is, is I think, the most important thing in a creative process. What are your other forms of creative expression? The drawings, the, the artwork, we know a lot of it's in the exhibition downstairs, but what are you, what are you doing now? for other forms? I, you know, I think it's important to just do whatever you like to do. I mean, that's why if you're a director, if you, but if you write and you draw, whatever, play music, whatever, it's like, it's good to, because it all feeds into the same thing. I mean, that, that's what I loved about what they did with the show. It's just, it just shows that, you know, it all goes to something, the same thing, but you can get there in many different ways. So it's important to, there's many forms of expression that you have to use. Yeah, use them all. Yes, so you have the mic? Yep. yep. Um, I was just wondering uh, how you balance, say, your creative work life with your creative personal life. Like, obviously, there's a lot of money riding on the films that you work on, so there's obviously a lot of uh, time, dedication. They need to spend um, working on them and everything, yeah. but how do you say, what if you just wanted to draw for drawing's sake, personally, or read a book with no intention of like adapting it, how do you find the time to do those things while still being able to work on these big projects? That well, yeah, you don't. I mean, the thing is, you don't. I mean, when you work on a project, you're, that's, your li that's it for whatever, a year, two years, whatever. So, you know, you get kind of strange you know you're kind of outside the loop of society you know but that's fine you know <laughs> but yeah you don't you don't yeah you don't really have much time for anything but you know that's why you have to be passionate about what you do because you're spending a lot of time doing it sure. yes we've got a, a question down here second row
Uh, hi, Tim. Um, I'm with the New Media Lab at the Canadian Film Centre. We're looking at you know stuff that spans multiple media. And I was wondering, at what point do you start to develop the stuff that's other than the film, and how involved are you with that? Well, I mean, the thing is with that stuff, with stuff, you never know what it's going to be. That's that's the interesting thing. It's like sometimes you do a drawing, and it could turn into something that's for a film. It could not be. It could be, uh, you know, something you stick in a drawer and never look at again. Um, but that's the great thing. The important thing is to just do, and that's why. You know, I, I'll won't think so much. I, if I do a drawing, whatever, you just do it. And then if it means something, you know, it, it was like the, the Jack Skeleton character. I would drawn that for ages before. And then I kept thinking, well, why do I keep drawing this stupid stick fit? You know, but it meant something to me. And so sometimes it, it, uh, it grows on you. And you never quite know if it's going to be something, a project, a drawing, uh, photograph, piece of writing, and uh, it's just best to kind of create that pool of things and then see what sta stays with you, you know? And usually then that means that that's meaningful to you and therefore, you know, something coming from a position of strength. So, you know, it all kind of goes into the same thing. Mm -hmm. I mean, you produce quite a few films that, that you don't direct as well as, as many that you do direct. What, what is it about producing that interests you? Is it a chance to facilitate up-and-coming voices? Yeah, yeah, well, I mean, there's, like, people that I'm working with now, and, you know, and I like, you know, uh, this director, Timor, who's done some great stuff. And so it's a way to meet people and kind of see, like, you know, I'm doing something where it's like, oh, you know what, I kind of want to see his version of this, mm -hmm. you know? And... So if, if you have the opportunity to do that, I can't do that all the time, but sometimes it's, it's really nice and, and, and it's nice to be surprised and see something yeah. else doing something. Yeah, and you were involved with uh, the, f the feature film version of Nine, yeah. directed by Shane Acker, uh, Stars Animation. I think there's some Stars folks here today. How did you come to be involved in that project? Just met him and liked what he did and you know, yeah. just tried to help him out. Um, and uh, you know, because like I said, I know what it's like uh, try to get something done mm -hmm. and if you can sometimes help somebody um, you know that's great yeah. and, you know, I liked his work. We have to leave it there. Tim is on a very tight schedule. Thank he doesn't have time to, to sign or, or answer any more questions but please thank, thank you very much.